people gave sort of very quick, brief descriptions of themselves, but around the room, we have a great deal of talent in grant writing, community partnerships, program implementation. We've got the community engagement core from the CCTST represented here, um, public health and a variety of other things. So there's, there's quite a bit of talent here today. And uh, I encourage everybody to, to speak up, ask questions, and make comments along the way. But with that, I'm going to turn it over to Vic and Susan. Great. Well, thank you, Dick, you know, for having us here. Um, so I think this is rather timely uh, because if we talk about grants, um, Sue and I have been uh, sort of pursuing how do we get funding for the concepts that, um, that I'm going to share with you. Um, but I think out of, out of interest and I'm pursuing I'm sorry, Laura, we can barely hear him. Can we turn it up yeah, or move the phone? Yeah, move the phone. Well, should be working. Okay. So how do I advance the slide? Uh, move the down arrow is probably the down. Oh, here. Or here. Yeah, Which yeah. One? Here? Let's see if that works. Um, sometimes you have to click on it. Click on the slide somewhere. I Okay. So, um, so as I mentioned, I'm a pediatric surgeon. I've been here. Uh, I was recruited to actually start the trauma center here at Cincinnati Children's Hospital. At the time, there was no level one trauma center. I have a fair number of slides. I'm not going to dwell on each one, but I'm hoping that they will sort of be touch points for further discussion. All right. Um, and I welcome uh, sort of uh, you know points and counterpoints. Uh, but basically what I'm going to really sort of suggest is, is that our current efforts at dealing with growing inequities in health uh, are, are somewhat disconnected. Um, uh, doing good is not good enough. Uh, we have increasing uh, gaps, uh, and uh, Cincinnati is an outlier, uh, not only as far as uh, child poverty, but also health disparities as well as violence. Um, and so I'm going to touch on, on these factors. And I'm also going to suggest a new term, which some of you may be familiar with it, and that is syndemics. It's uh, something that Meryl Singer has uh, sort of brought up, but Bobby Milstein, um, and the people that I'm going to mention are people with whom I've had conversations who have sort of helped inform my thinking. Um, and what I'm going to suggest is, is that our approach is really, to me, for the most part, characterized by linear thinking, where we look at a problem, we're going to address it, and really because of the interconnectedness the heterogeneity, the adaptiveness of the learning, um, and the interdependencies that these are complex issues that exist within a complex adaptive, adaptive system uh, that basically will resist our uh, past as well as ongoing efforts. Um, and then I'm going to follow up with sharing some of what yeah. we're doing so currently. I got into this uh, just principally principally because even though we had to develop an, a wonderful trauma center where the survival rate exceeded the national average, uh, I was still sort of struck with uh, kids coming in with, uh, this child was a victim of a gunshot wound, uh, were arrested several times. Uh, but if you notice that one thing uh, that appeals to me as far as dealing with children is, is that she still has a smile even though she's blind in one eye as a result of one of the bullets going through. Uh, and paralyzed because the bullet went through her chest and paralyzed her spine. Um, okay, so obviously I um, should probably stay in the surgery and operate with them. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> there we go. Okay, so, uh, and this is another example of how resilient a child is. Uh, this is a little, I, cannot, uh, I have permission for this, but uh, here he is post op, here he is, he's showing off his. Uh, thank you. Um, He's showing off his incision, but this is he uh, about three months earlier, where he again nearly died. Um, so I, I embarked on this after making a promise to a mother who actually literally died in my hands as a, uh, from a gunshot wound to the chest, and I said to her that I was not going to let her, her this child's death be one in vain, uh, that I was going to do not what I could, but really what everything that was necessary. So as an academic surgeon, we pursue things uh, not just because you read it in Reader's Digest, you look at the literature, you do randomized controlled trials, and then you embark on that. Um, we, uh, I felt that um, 
that what we were doing as far as addressing trauma, which was my initial focus, uh, was not availing ourselves. We were not availing ourselves of the available science. Uh, the National Academy of Sciences, about four years ago, uh, basically put out a document sort of pleading with us uh, that we should use science as evidence for public policy. And in that document, it suggested that less than 5% of public policy actually is informed by the science. Less than 5% of public policy is informed by the science. So examples of that is somebody is going to say, I'm going to get 10,000 kids out of poverty. I'm going to start off with 5,000, and you know, we're going to do that. Not realizing that one of the consequences of that potentially look is if you ignore the neighborhood context, uh, that getting 5,000 people out of poverty, one of the challenges that you're going to be presented with as an unintended consequence is that the people will move out of these impoverished neighborhoods, making those neighborhoods even more toxic, okay, and furthering then the decline or increasing in, in gaps. So um, what we now know is established, okay, is, is that the neighborhood, and that's one of the contentions I'm going to make, the argument, neighborhood focus is actually more important and targeting individuals as we try to address these health disparities. That if we could transform neighborhoods, okay, truly transform neighborhoods, then much of the work that we see, for example, as uh, having somebody, somebody who started the first weight loss surgery program for children at a children's hospital, uh, we would address obesity. Lawrence Katz, in his work with the Moving to Opportunity study, one of the outcomes, he said that that was the most effective anti-obesity program by moving children out of concentrated disadvantage. So the, the terms that I'm going to inter just sort of transpose and, and it will mean the same, concentrated disadvantage, socioeconomic context, and neighborhood disadvantage. Okay, those, are, those, those are the same. So this came out of the Sackler uh, Colloquium back in 2011, and it was a congregation of of world-class cross-disciplinary individuals who uh, represented the basic sciences, biomedical, social scientists to, ex to explore the, the biological embedding of urban social diversity. And the major contention, the conclusion is, is that socioeconomic position is not a, but the single most important determinant of health development in every society, and that the rapidly accumulating evidence Suggests that differential exposure to these early childhood adversities contributes strongly to the social disparity that we see here in Cincinnati. Uh, in mental and physical, it's also in the slide that as a result of certain segments of our population being concentrated in certain neighborhoods, cohorts segregated say, racially and economically neighborhoods, uh, they, that, that's what's contributing to the health issues, and the life expectancy and for certain neighborhoods, people who live in certain neighborhoods, is in the order of something between 20 years different. Okay. Uh, cognitive and social emotional, I'm going to sort of show you that as a consequence of growing up in these impoverished neighborhoods, child brain development is impaired. It's not just that they're not studying but their actual brain development, as far as cerebral cortex volume, surface area. I'll also show you data that suggests that even for adults who stayed in these neighborhoods, that those neighborhoods are, in some cases, yes, there's correlation, but the strength of the correlation is suggesting that there's a correlation. And we have available now plus the MRI that can actually help to demonstrate some of these findings. And is that uh, so cognitive, social, emotional development? I'll show you data as far as stress reactivity for adolescents, uh, but also stress re re uh, uh, cortisol re reactivity for children. Uh, and so we wonder what, what are those kids doing? Why are they acting up? Well, it's ADHD or ADD, they get their medication. Perhaps it's not that. Perhaps it's the environment that they're in that they're facing. Others would say, well, it's the parent. These data would suggest uh, that that's not enough. Okay. Uh, and again, the argument then is, is that you can look at, as we continue to do, look at individuals, or you can look at the neighborhood context of kids that we are living. Clearly, the latter is much more challenging than ever it is. That, I think, is absolutely urgent in Cincinnati to make any progress as far as the inequality that 
or inequality. Um, so, so what do I want to do? The left one. Here. Okay. So this is, uh, I don't know how many of you are familiar with Raj Chetty's work. Raj Chetty. Right. So Raj Chetty is an economist, um, and an extraordinary individual. Uh, he has substantiated now, added more rigor to the argument that sociologists have been making for decades. William Julius Wilson, I'm sorry, John. Uh, William Julius Wilson, um, in, uh, as early as 1987, established the fact that in neighborhoods, it's not the individuals, but it's the neighborhoods that people are in. Uh, and that the reason for the neighborhood deterioration uh, suggested by Patrick Morgan and his one hand response is the disappearance of work. So his book, The Children Disadvantaged, is another one that is more than just race, and that work disappears in the street. Uh, one read. But what Raj Chetty has done then as an economist is demonstrated right, the impact, the influence of neighborhoods on child development. And what he suggests in this study, in, in this particular graph, he looked at neighborhoods. If you were born in Cincinnati, comparing Cincinnati and Pittsburgh, you don't move out before you're 10 years of age. You're going to have a 70% likelihood of getting a decent regular job. Intergenerational. The longer you stay in that neighborhood, right, the greater the likelihood that you will be there for generations and generations and generations. And moving to opportunity studies that he based this work on as well. Larry Katz, if you move that child out, the earlier the child moves out, the greater the likelihood is that the child will be improved. This is that whole uh, uh, panel of folks. Does it matter where they move? Low poverty. Okay. But even furthermore, it matters if those, that low poverty area is less segregated. If there are more fathers present, doesn't mean that 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 the family that moves out has a father, but even in neighborhoods, better quality schools and less violence. this talk in some places, I say, we cannot win. Every year that goes by, clock is ticking. That child then is destined to fail in life. And what we're seeing here is that then these children are the ones who do not graduate from school, again, the brain, we should talk about that, uh, but also they're more likely to be incarcerated with women and girls are more likely to have teenage pregnancies. Okay. Perfect. Okay. Do I have your attention? All right. So, what am I doing? Double right. clicking on the right. Oh. All right. If you right click, you're going to get that full slide. If you left click, you So I skipped the slide. Yes. Now. So now how do I go back? You can use the or you can use the arrow. All right. So. You click on the slide first, though. You clicked on the other thing. All right. So um, this is. Uh, someone just asked if Vic could talk closer to the microphone. Um, I think it's because he is standing up and close to the screen. So you know that's why he may sound like he's coming in and out. Right. Right. So this is again. I'll go quickly through this, and I'll, I'm happy to share these slides with you so that you can look at the sites, the right. resources. This right. is not opinion. Right. Okay. All right. So um, uh, this is from the Pew Charitable Trust. Okay. Uh, that there's been no progress since the civil rights movement. I'm going to come back to that, and that absolutely infuriates me. When you think about children marching in Alabama, and, and, but despite the optimism of the times, children born in the civil rights era have made little, if any, advancement out of the conditions that they were in. None. Very little. Right? So you can... All right. And so uh, what Rob Sampson, another person who is, uh, I'm working with, uh, is uh, Henry Ford, the second professor of sociology at Harvard, uh, 
says we have to change neighborhood and that the singular focus on just individual improvement is not going to reach the scale that it's actually going to address the inequities that we see that are actually worsening. That we need to look at contextual mobility, and by it's contextual mobility and not just individual mobility. Individual mobility refers to what Raj Chetty, as a result of his research, is doing with the help of the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, and that is moving people out of the impoverished neighborhoods. That is not scalable. And in our current climate, as far as the animus that's <laughs> towards people of different color, it's not, it's not scalable. Okay? There are not enough sort of um, neighborhoods that are open to inclusivity and diversity. There's still the sense of not in my neighborhood. So that then is the emphasis for the contextual mobility. How do we take low poverty neighborhoods, not gentrify them as we've seen in some areas in which I feel is going on in Avondale now and Walnut Hills, but changing it in a way that all the people, particularly the people who are there, are benefiting from that. Right? That we need to then understand the importance of compounded deprivation. What Samson is talking about here is in his most recent paper, Toxic and punishing, punishing Environments, is really you need to look at what has happened as far as kids getting, getting, getting kicked out of schools, uh, suspended, so there's a racial disproportion as far as that's concerned. All right, when we've taken, and how that might that be mediated since we now know about, or you will know about uh, adolescent uh, stress reactivity, cortisol reactivity. Uh, so what Farah, Martha Farah, as early as 2008 demonstrated is, is that um, there are three areas of the brain that are uh, affected uh, by being born uh, to a mother who's in poverty. Uh, actually, she would also say that if you're born in concentrated disadvantaged neighborhoods to a mother who's in extreme poverty, that's worse than being born to a mother addicted to crack cocaine. Uh, and that was the neonatologist that. Uh, but the these interventions need to be durable. And what we tend to do is, let's say for the pivot program that the city of Cincinnati is doing, it's there for a year. Right? So now I know, you know they're trying to sort of extend it, but it's not something that is looking long term as far as, and then also the amount of money that needs to replace decades of disinvestment in these neighborhoods to sort of transform them. We need to be aware of the racial penalties uh, which are still persistent and extremely large. And he, I think, intentionally are, proposes the rather provocative statement about affirmative action. The increase in the gap uh, in wealth among, between whites and African Americans is greater than the gap in wealth between the, lower, the lowest caste in India and uh, the more elite in India over the same time frame. And that's from a great resource is Good Economics for Hard Times. Uh, there are 2019 Nobel Prize winners uh, of economics, Abhijit Banerjee and his wife, Esther Flo. Okay, so there are resources that you can use. So you say, Garcia, you're just too pessimistic. No. You, you can look at um, the number of dashboards that you could use. Susan was telling me, oh, well, look, there's a federal something or other. Well, there have been dashboards for some time. Uh, this is one from NYU Langone Center. Uh, some of you may be familiar, looking at life expectancy, linked to racial and ethnic segregation by neighborhood. Uh, I was giving a talk in, in uh, Ann Arbor, and I wanted to show them the difference between Detroit, Michigan, and Ann Arbor, Michigan. Right? And so, you know, life expectancy, if you're in Ann Arbor, you want to point out. If you live in Detroit, Michigan, it's not 81.9, you can look at it lower, 82.4. We have a similar pattern here in Cincinnati. You look surprised. It's just crazy. Yes, it is. Well, I'll, I'll grow this in. Evanston, which I'm going to talk about in Avondale, Evanston's life expectancy is 73.1 years. Avondale, not north, but Avondale is 68 years. So I want to pose a question for you. So why is there such a gap in life expectancy? Well, what would 
the pundit said. Because they're making these poor decisions, right? Because of the homicides, the shootings, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, and, and I, that would be where I think most people would jump to would be yeah. homicides, yeah. drug-related deaths, mm -hmm. um, things like, and, and certain uh, chronic conditions. Well, access to care is a huge yeah. problem. So these are all, you know, plausible, plausible things. But I'm yeah. going to suggest that there's something even more upstream. <coughs> Okay, so what I'm arguing is, is that much of our work, much of our attention, much of our focus is downstream. Okay, but what if we found out who was throwing the kids into the river? You know that apocryphal tale, right? Okay, so I, I shared with you the importance of concentrated disadvantage and poverty. Okay, so here is okay um, a uh, from that uh, you know that, that previous work. Uh, here's a depiction of what's happening uh, where my hospital falls home, 45229. 93%, almost 93% of the children are in extreme poverty. Okay. And then we wonder, actually, and you'll see what happens as far as the brain is concerned, et cetera, et cetera. All right, so school absenteeism. Uh, here I drew a comparison um, between North Avondale, Montessori, and South Avondale, who chronic absence, right? So we got to be in school to learn. Right? Uh, again, we're taking disregarding all the facts as far as how poverty affects brain, brain development. This huge school chronic absence is 32 percent. Not even what a mile away, North mm -hmm. Avondale, school absence. So disparities, uh, you know, the idea then that we're going to be able to learn, um, and then here, this is data that's available for, for, for you to take a look at. But this is what concerns me. Again, so Chetty has really opened the eyes of a lot of skeptics, right, and is drawing in a lot of funding. Bill and Melinda Gates, again, is funding his work in Seattle, Washington. Uh, this is the most recent, December 2019. I invite you to really take a look at these guys as far as race and economic opportunity and inter intergenerational perspective. Right? Well, let's go to the conclusion. Few areas of small black and white gaps tend to be low poverty and uh, neighborhoods with low levels of racial bias among whites. Right? So Jackie talked about well, what are the factors in neighborhoods? Right? Well, low racial bias among whites, et cetera. Rates of size, <coughs> rates of father presence among whites. Black males who move such neighborhoods earlier in childhood had significantly better outcomes. However, fewer than 5% of black children, this is national data, grow up in such neighborhoods. Less than 5% of black children. Despite the optimism of the time, there's another civil rights leader. So another resource is the Opportunity Atlas. Um, this is an entity that came out of the Economic Innovation Group. Sean, Nap uh, Sean Parker, who's the founder of Napster, said that despite the recovery from the recession, that there has been unequal, unequal improvements as far as neighborhoods. So this is an atlas that you can look at as far as neighborhoods. Uh, and the idea was that it was bipartisan, Legislation that was passed. Are you familiar with this uh, economic uh, innovation group thing? Okay, uh, is that we're going to go ahead and look at private investment to help you know, retransform these neighborhoods. Okay. Um, and great idea, but um, great idea. Yeah, click on that. And uh, yeah. If you right click, it'll let you move back. All right, here we are. Okay, so uh, this so great idea. All right, but opportunity zones exist. This is uh, an article that was in the New York Times and several others uh, that the opportunity zones actually turn out to be the best of suburban areas. So you can go, you can look, you can download the Excel file, and the entity that is most conspicuous by its presence. Or money that's awarded is an entity called CDC. Okay, so we have lots of buildings, even in Walnut Hills, that are driving homes uh, you know, you know, for sale. 
number of uh, three degrees. Number one is that the impact of oil emission is predicted by the McKenzie report of 2017 is to eliminate about 300 million pounds. The elevator of the most impact that it'll be going to are industries locally in California. Walmart, they feel that. So let's move quickly. So it is almost irrefutable that the that that the importance of, of of addressing our schools, I mean our schools, our neighborhoods, transforming our neighborhoods is absolutely critical as far as shaping uh, children's outcomes. All children, by the way. Okay. Um, I don't want to dwell on this as far as, uh, uh, but we have an. Ex there are some pundits who are saying we have unbelievable economies, 3.6 unemployment rate, lowest in the history of this nation. Uh, but it's not as rosy as people would suggest that these jobs, for the most part, are low paying jobs. And that are not really resulting in the transformation of these individuals uh, or the neighborhoods in which they, in which they live. Okay. So, and uh, there are not enough decent paying jobs for people without bachelor's degrees. But here's something that since I thought, uh, since we're all concerned about health care, that I need to address uh, with my address. Neighborhood disadvantage, and I wanted to just highlight some of these things in red, uh, has been now, since Martha Farrow's work has really started a lot of this appreciation of what does compensating disadvantaged students with care mean. What she did then uh, is uh, did some of the early studies looking at the functional look at activities that they can take advantage of. Uh, and she has since generated uh, <laughs> uh, not only a center for neuroscience, but there is also a center of neuroethics. Knowing the impact of being born in constant poverty, what it means for the life of the children uh, that it assumes now an ethical decision. What should we do about this? Georgetown lawyer said, we now know that growing up is compensated Differential vulnerability by gender, which I would argue is one of the reasons we see boys seem to be acting out, incarcerated, engaged in more criminal activity. This is not even to mention the lead poison that Kim Dietrich from this institution also addressed. Yes, sir. Oh. Oh. Sorry. Did I start all over again? No. <laughs> <laughs> You'll get to sit closer sure, to the microphone. Ben. Okay, so what do I want to do? Yeah, we'll see you all right here. Here, we'll see all that to the right button. Forward or backward? Forward, and then the laser is. Yeah, it may not show on the. Uh, we're sharing the screen, I think. Yeah. All right, okay. So, anyway. Okay. It should work. All right, so I'm going to quickly go through this neighborhood disadvantage, adolescent stress reactivity. Wonderful details as far as cortisol and how it affects the brain. Okay. So, well, I'm really excited. About it. So, association of neighborhood level with cerebral and hippocampal volumes, hippocampus memory, right? Cerebral executive function. But I wasn't content there. I wanted to just show you on your right the exhaustive research that's been done, really highlighting the impact that neighborhood disadvantage has on these kids. But not just kids, but also adults. Okay. But not only just functional MRIs, but telomere length. Shorter your telomere, the shorter your life. Ah, but we're here in a cancer center. Neighborhood disadvantage and social determinants of triple negative breast cancer. There's a disparity as far as black women who have breast cancer. This author would suggest that it's not just, it's not incidence, but it's the triple negative, the more aggressive form, and then the outcome. Neighborhood disadvantage. Okay. Right. Now, they're looking at okay, how do we then, uh, 
what, what, what's the, what are the underlying mechanisms? Uh, and, and then how do we potentially intervene in that? Uh, the New England Journal of Medicine has taken this issue as far as social determinants of health quite seriously so that they have now ongoing series of articles looking at structural violence. And the one particularly that is of germane to this topic is in Chicago, how uh, the uh, patient navigators are quite effective in identifying uh, women with breast cancer and getting them appropriately uh, directed. All right, so, uh, and then what about heart disease? Um, so African Americans, right, disproportionately dying from cardiovascular disease and uh, strokes. And, uh, and, and so here are, uh, again, uh, additional studies looking at systolic blood pressure when you're in a poor neighborhood and then when you move out of that poor neighborhood, okay, without any changes in medication, your blood pressure goes up. Okay. All right. So, and what about the transition from adolescence to adults? So again, this, these neighborhoods okay, are major determinants of how long we live, how well we live, okay, and how intelligent we, we are. Fragile family study, 1,000 children, 28 years of age, in disadvantaged neighborhoods, increases in blood pressure, largest increases in blacks, and it's explained uh, by neighborhood. Um, I put this here because we've met an enormous amount of uh, success in passing the preschool promise. Okay. How many would have say that the preschool promise, there's no debate that preschool education is important, correct? How many would say that preschool promise is the answer? Without reading this, don't read it. How many would say preschool promises that it's going to work? Everything else being equal. The answer would suggest to this study, which is the most recent study, would suggest that that's not not going to work. Okay. But if you take into account what we just talked about, hippocampal volume, stress reactivity, okay, uh, there's no surprise that we're going to. I'm, I'm not surprised that we're not going to see the results that we were promised. And then what are the Charles Murray of the world going to say? You know who Charles Murray is, right? Mm -hmm. Charles Murray is the one that, well, the people are inferior. Those yeah. people are inferior. There are people like that. Like, you know, the Crick and Watson guy, he said. So, uh, and so they're going to say, well, I told you so. Okay. So. Uh, so this is Patrick Sharkey, another one of the folks that uh, we're working with. Uh, if you're raised in a high poverty neighborhood, uh, if you're raised in a high poverty neighborhood, one generation has a sub substantial negative effect on child cognitive ability in the next generation. This is again what Sharkey, what Chetty also sort of um, also demonstrated as far as educational outcomes. Um, but again, the thing that uh, Rob Sampson said in critique of Chetty, we sociologists were arguing this years ago. And it's only until Chetty with his work as an economist. And, uh, so um, the impact I'm trying to share with you is from a health standpoint, every organ system is impacted by, and this is by, uh, this is uh, Bob Sapolsky's uh, work, it's a great article in, in uh, uh, in uh, Scientific American. All right, so uh, how early does this affect? Uh, this is, <laughs> again, from Martha Farah's work, uh, as early as five weeks of age. The reason this, port, this study is important is because the critics would say, well, well, that's because these teenage women have new babies when they're younger, and that's what's contributing to the poor outcomes. This is healthy uh, African American infants, not premature. But the common denominator is that they are impoverished neighborhoods. Uh, lead poisoning, I don't want to dwell on that. Cincinnati is an outlier as far as the reduction in violence. Uh, the reduction in violence nationally, as far as homicide among blacks, is the equivalent of curing cancer, is what Sharpie would suggest. But there are three exceptions. Baltimore, New York, and Cincinnati. Okay, so we'll just, uh, and this slide, are we doing on time? That's good. 
<laughs> okay. So um, we, um, the, the reason I put this slide up is, is that David Williams is a sociologist at, uh, again at Harvard and uh, suggested that we have excess lives. Uh, a colleague of mine, and uh, they, we did a thought experiment and we said, okay, since 1965, 1965, um, what is, uh, how many people have died? So it's 96,500 excess lives, excess deaths because of these health disparities. Uh, and the math is that uh, since the past 50, 55 years, that's 6 million people who have died prematurely. Why is that 6 million? Why does that disturb me? It should disturb you. It was 6 million who died in the Holocaust. Right. I'm over a much quicker period of time. All right, so um, the wealth gap, this is the wealth gap between blacks and whites. This is the McKinsey Report, recent, 2019, um, that contributes. Um, so seriously, how much time do I have to stop? Well, do you want me to stop? Like 10 minutes. We have 10 minutes, okay, so let me just quickly go through this. I would really like to share. Okay. <laughs> Charge. Yeah. So um, the uh, this is the two books. Bill, Bill, um, the the uh, uh, hillbilly elegy, and all right. Um, both of them mention Wilson. Uh, if you haven't, if you read hillbilly elegy, you'll see that Wilson is quoted in in both books. Okay. So let's get to. So um, let's move here. All right, so how we're going to work on this stuff and then how are we going to deal with it is uh, going to require a, a new approach, something different. And my argument is, is that we need to look at this neighborhood transformation is how do we influence a complex adaptive system. It's not going to be top down or bottom up. Um, it, I would propose that we use a social lab and a platform for that is um, what um, colleague here, Sue, who's going to talk a little bit about. Okay. Thank you. So, this is, Dr. Garcia is fabulous, as you know, and he presents many places and people just absolutely love him and evaluate him top of the notch. And so I have learned a lot from him as I became director of the Center for Population Health, and we are forming academic community partnerships. So this social lab that uh, this just talked about is what uh, we have formed with Evanston and Avondale. We just formed it with a grant from Prevention First. But what I have formed, and this goes with our social lab idea, is the residents form the coalition. It's not us sitting around the table or on the phone, but rather the residents form the coalition. And they are working hard to improve their neighborhoods so their children don't have to move out, rather they move in. So Evanston, for example, I'm uh, the president of Evanston's uh, community council, Dr. Greg Stewart, his PhD is in social work, and, um, and then the president of Avondale, uh, Sandra Jones Mitchell. We have met with their coalitions. The coalitions on this list are folks who represent the business sector, schools, youth, uh, marketing, government, parents, and such. And these folks meet with me. We're just starting it this year as we're implementing what Vic is talking about. But it's exciting because what they're doing and what we're talking about is bringing businesses into their neighborhoods and the businesses will employ the folks living in the neighborhood. So we're changing socioeconomic status within the neighborhood rather than telling everybody move out to get better. And so Evanston, if you drive through Evanston, they have a 10-year plan that started um, 2020 <laughs> and they wrote it in 2019 and uh, Dr. Greg Stewart has been working hard and also like Georgia Brown in the Evanston Employment Resource Center which is on the corner of Montgomery and Dana, and or Woodburn, and um, Georgia Brown, Yvonne Jones are all part of my coalition. Getting jobs for folks, the Evanston Recreation Center has just been built, 
getting the students in there. We have a huge youth um, coalition talking with the parents and the youth to get information on substance abuse and such and how the youth can work together with the parents and the neighbors to stop that. And so Evanston is becoming pretty, they're addressing, they both, both neighborhoods, both coalitions have goals for their neighbors. And what's exciting is, like you all, can work to support, not go in and say, okay, this is what you need to do, but rather support them because they want to. The Evanston 10-year plan is 147 pages. Um, I read it all, and it's very exciting what their goals are, and it's to address everything that Dick just presented within their community and the residents are doing it. And they're doing a good job beautifying the neighborhood, trying to reduce the move out and rather support the staying there, the support of the schools, the academic success of the children and the youth in there. Avondale is having a rougher time. They have a lot of out-of-state owners of the property, the rental apart property in there, the out-of-state folks are difficult to find. So if there's mold and sewage issues and such, and they try to reach these folks, they can't find them. And they one, one apartment complex had put a manager in the out-of-state to change that manager eight times in a year. So that, again, folks living in that building couldn't find them to complain about the mold, which is health issues and the sewage. Consequently, when they do complain, they get evicted and then they become homeless. Um, the other problem in Avondale that's uh, serious is there's no high school in Avondale. So the teenagers all have to leave Avondale to go to high school. And when they leave to go to high school, when they come back, there is nothing for the teenagers other than the gangs. And that creates more problems. So uh, what Sandra Mitchell and her council are wanting to do, the coalition, is address all of this in a positive way. Both neighborhoods want positive language. They do not want the negative language. They want to, um, and they both, what um, Avondale has created is the quality improvement plan. And their quality improvement plan has the goal to improve um, the academics for the youth, to improve housing, to improve, again, business being located there. Neither one has the grocery stores. They want to get that back. Access to food, the food insecurity is a huge social problem. Access to health care, especially for the seniors who are living in isolation, who don't have access care increases the um, problem with health care delivery and thus the um, life expectancy. Um, so what we're wanting to do um, through the Center for Population Health and with Vic's social lab um, series and such is help these neighborhoods achieve their goals, which they have outlined. They outlined them, and it is related to what we just heard in depth, but it's active. You know, instead of sitting around a table talking about it all the time, we want to do something, and that's what we're doing. So, for example, um, both coalitions of the residents are wanting the students, the high school students, for example, to partner with Xavier students come over to Xavier, walk around campus, because Evanston and Avondale are Xavier's located in those neighborhoods, and come over and just see what it's like to go to college. They don't need to go to Xavier, but they need to say, oh, this is good. I can do this. I can be accepted. I can, I can be one of these folks. I can have a future. And the other thing uh, are Department of Education is doing, or School of Education, is sending now um, this 
students and need for their academic experience to go into the school in these two neighborhoods and assist in the classroom, which is helping the students, the college students, understand these issues versus, again, talk to them, go see, go understand, go learn how to talk with the folks living in these neighborhoods, help them be successful in their environment. Again, understanding how to teach that disadvantaged student so that disadvantaged student can be successful if they have someone standing behind them going, you can do it, you can do it, and I'll help you. I'll help you learn to read. I'll help you understand that math problem. And the, the Xavier student needs to understand when they go in as a teacher later um, that they can do this. Actually, my niece, Laura Moran, is a sixth grade teacher in the Evanston Academy. And she's been there for years and works hard with helping these students succeed. And some of them do not have parents, they have single family parents, or the parents aren't even high school graduates. So to help these children succeed is critical. So um, we want, I mean, this is up and starting. Again, it's not talk anymore, we're doing it. And these co we're, our next coalition meeting with the two neighborhoods is going to be in the Evanston Recreation um, Center on March 11th at 3 o'clock. You're welcome to join us and hear what these folks have to say and hear what they say the gaps are, the needs are. And these are the coalitions and the presidents of these two groups. And Greg and Sandra are exciting, they're dynamic. And they're supporting the goals their residents put forward, which is, again, to address everything we just heard. And so, um, let's see what I'm going to add some other things. One of the things um, in, in the agenda here for April of, uh, 6th, when we have our um, all day conference at Xavier Tomorrow's Healthcare Today. Um, Amy Acton, who is the uh, direct medical director for the state of Ohio healthcare, um, she was appointed by DeWine February 19th. She was homeless. She was a child. And when she was 12, she actually lived in a tent. She is very excited for the state of Ohio to achieve social, address the social determinants of health. So hopefully you all can come and listen to her if you can't stay for the whole day. Amy Beck or Andy Beck from Children's will be talking in the afternoon. We have breakout sessions. Vic referred to this. This just came out February this month, 219, 220. Um, and it's the state Medicaid programs are being asked to address the data and gather the data on priority needs we can execute social determinants of health, monitor and evaluate the impacts of what we're doing. So nationally, we truly are trying to address it. We now have the ICD code Z55 to Z65 that are all on social determinants of health. They don't get, they're not billable yet, but they are um, because we don't have the resources to treat them. Yet it's the beginning. We're moving forward, and that's what's exciting. The American Community Survey has been conducted, and you can have access to that also to um, get information on social determinants and health equity, which the nation is trying to um, address. So there is a lot going on. I wish I had more time to share it, but it is exciting. Jen Gibson, who was on the phone from our psych department, she, she and others um, at Xavier in the faculty level are wanting to address the um, evaluation measures and data collection of these different efforts. We want to do a CCTST grant to look at social isolation of our seniors and access and if we can do that, can we lower the cost of healthcare 
US, Ohio spends the average amount of health care costs as the nation does, but we're ranked 46 in our value because we don't have health equity. Uh, Ohio is ranked low. And our rural, 55% of us is rural. We don't have primary care in that area. So the folks are coming in when they're stage four cancer, not screening for early. Cancer Justice Network with Steve Sunderland is working hard with the um, patient navigators to get early screening so we prevent stage four. Um, the, cancer, the community health worker is now becoming a major person in our health care delivery. We want to get more of those folks involved and as part of the health care team because they can help with the social determinants piece. So I'm aware of time. I'm sorry we don't have discussion opportunity for question and answer. Well, we appreciate that you could give us as much as you could. <laughs> um, and uh, yeah, I'm sorry we had a meeting. There was a meeting at, until nine, and so we got a late start. Um, but we really appreciate you coming to tell us about all these opportunities that people can get involved in, and this. Uh, video will be available online and since we weren't able to get to all the slides, we'll make the slides available as well. Uh, so, uh, go ahead. I was just going to say perhaps we can leave this over until next week and have a discussion maybe yeah. next mm -hmm. week about, about mm -hmm. that. Um, maybe we could get you on a call next week. So the one thing <laughs> I, I just want to add by way of summary, as you were talking I was jotting yeah, things exactly. down. A uh, couple things that, that we like to focus on. You, to make a lot of this work, you need money. So part of it is what pieces can be sliced off where there, there is robust and stable and large enough funding. And there are, we have to look into that a little bit more. I don't want to go in too much, but we do know that there is there's funding for research and a variety of things that you've touched on. Um, uh, the CORI, which is the Patient Centered Outcome Research Inc., uh, was just reauthorized for 10 years. So that's not going to go away as we all thought it was. And, and that money is in this space, and we do have some experience getting some of those grants here. There are a lot of evaluation grants, and of course, the community action grants, which are programmatic is grants. Hmm? How much money is that? And, and PCORI, that's a little bit, it, it, a, a fair amount. And I'll tell you what, that they're looking for these kinds of things because they have, they've struggled with getting traditional researchers to pivot and do things that are more patient-centered because that's not in the mindset of our researchers. So when I talked to the people at PCORI, they were really frustrated that they didn't get better proposals. And I think um, there's always an opening there. Part of that money, it's always been a public-private partnership, so part of that money um, sits in uh, HRQ. There's PCORI money there, but PCORI is an independent office out, supposedly outside of the government. It's run independently, but the grants are huge, $10 million. Uh, I think we got an 8 or $10 million grant here out of psychiatry. Um, so they're significant. It's hundreds of millions of dollars that's, that's available annually. So they're not inconsequential. Um, but the other thing that I was thinking is, in general, the, the real difficulty in addressing this at this level is we have tremendous resources at, at the university that we would have to bring to bear in the, the way we have to, to go to their strengths. So as you were talking about issues in the neighborhood, DAP, um, our, our DAP college has a whole unit on, on community planning. There's a lot of expert expertise there, and they have researchers there that would look at this from a unique perspective that would give you something you probably don't have now and give you an edge in getting grants in that space. Engineering, uh, neurology, as you start talking about stress, I've got a whole group of uh, people in the neurosciences that are studying stress and in ways where they've got the, the, the research expertise to be writing a wide range of grants, that, that, but they would, they would go to that specific point. So when you were talking, I was writing all these things down where we have 
niche expertise that uh, in order to get the money and get the expertise engaged, you've got to give them something that is in their wheelhouse. Um, and we've got a, I have a long I list of... The only uh, thing I want to say, Jack, real quick, though, yeah. is the residents in these coalitions I'm working with would not, they would want, they would be love to have the funding, but they would want to be the part of the leadership team. Well, they'd not, have to be, they would have to be. If it's a PCORI grant, you have yeah. to engage. Uh, yes, but there are, there are right other. No, their announcements are all about disparities, um, addressing disparities, in, um, support for bringing people together. There, you know, if you go on the PCORI website, you can see that there's a ton. That would be really exciting. Um, our Department of, of Environmental Health has a great deal of expertise. It's it, but in, in their that. niche areas, in their niche areas. So I, I think we have a lot of expertise, and we may find as we go out and talk to it, try to get them engaged, that they wouldn't want to do something that would fit in to something that's helpful. But the expertise is there. It's a matter of, of well, getting them to connect. To connect. Yeah. yeah, we can do it together. Yeah, and I know that in the Department of Environmental Health, and I, I don't think they applied for it, uh, was that there was a huge health disparities grant that they were considering applying for. We didn't. They didn't. That, thank God, because they were, that was not who they are right now. Yeah. But, but there are grants out there in that space big grants out there in that space, if we put the right people together, and it does include the community, but um, what, what I can do at, at our place is find the areas where we have expertise in some of the particular things you're talking about. And some of them uh, will be, you know, um, more community connections and action oriented and some will be more traditional research that can be helpful to you on the back end. Um, but it's, it's, it, it really is painting this complex picture as, as Vic described it. It is very complex and you've got to look at, at a lot of the different pieces that are out there and see whether we have ways to make connections with expertise here that add a little bit more to our understanding, a little bit more to our ability to organize data and see what's going on, a little bit more to evaluating things that are going on. Um, that's just the mindset of a, a lot of our people here is they live in a small world. You have a big problem and it's going to be really hard for me to drag my faculty into your big world. Um, it, it will take a while, but what they have is tremendous expertise in smaller areas where they can add value to your bigger efforts. So for me, that's, that's a good first step that I can help you with, is get people to tell you where their expertise is and how it might benefit looking at your bigger problem. And then keep them out of the way. Are you familiar with the, I know you were going to go for a CCTSD grant, are you familiar with the CCTSD Community Engagement Board? Yeah. Um, and they have, they have a lot of programs that are, go to the organization. Yeah, and, and they're, they also have a lot of programs that are community focused, but they have the uh, Community Leadership Institute, which they help community members um, take on more of the leadership role and they kind of help train them. And they pay them. They, 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 we pay them to take this class and then go out and do things. Yeah. Um, they have the technology based one too. So they keep the community people and they train them how to do network administrators. And stuff yes. Like that. So that's right. Because you're talking about, you know, you have that community center. But those are low paying jobs. You know, the people that would work there, like the janitors and stuff like that. So it's good that they're having yep. a, a, a opportunity because it's still low paying jobs. So okay. they're addressing it by. Exactly and the, the evaluation of the, the, the Community Leadership Institute has been for every dollar we put into that, the training of these folks, they go out and get their own grants to the tune of about 20 to 1. Mm -hmm. So it, it's, it's, an enabling, it's an enabling channel that gives people sort of baseline understanding so that they can 
um, that they can think in ways that are, are more consistent with your bigger funding opportunities out there. And it's going to allow your community members who want to be the people that are leading them to lead it. So Greg Stewart, again, has a PhD, the Evanston fellow, and he taught at Miami and yep. such. You know, Greg? No, I don't think so. But I mean, it, it just send people to us or Stacy or Lori Crosby, and we will get them in into into that pathway. Um, and 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 it it gives them a, a a broader foundation from which you can work with right, them. Right, right. Well, I, I think Avondale is definitely in more need mm -hmm. yep. than Evanston. Evanston's been pretty well, successful. Yeah. Well, that's why they're 68 the average life. Yep. Yeah. So um, I want to thank you all for, for, for your time. Thank you very much for coming yeah. over. I also want to just sort of close on one thing. Uh, the Aspen Institute did a 20-year study on looking at community change initiatives and found that they did not ultimately transform the economic outcomes of individuals in the, in the community or actually transform the community. 20 years got how many billions of dollars, mm -hmm. okay? Um, and they subsequently they came out with, uh, with, a, with a document that looked at it and saying the community change is, a, is, is, is an issue of complexity and it requires a different set of tools that we as traditional researchers uh, are, not, are not aware of. And if you do invite me back, I can then continue the slides to suggest that there is uh, opportunities to look at how do we use system sciences and simulations in the hands of all the stakeholders, including the community? Uh, my early work on this is, is that like, working with the community, one of the community's outcomes was we're going to build uh, a bike path because they had a bike path in, in you know, Avondale, or not in Avondale, but in, in, in Marymount, and that was going to transform the neighborhood. Um, it's important then that everybody, including the neighborhood, see what the scope of the problem is in the complexity, and then use methodology to help test what might work and what will not yeah. work, and what might work, but yet in the short term might be good, but in the long term be bad, like mass incarceration. Well, you know, ultimately our plan and the way that we would approach something like this is, you know, as I said, everybody has their own niche, but what really opens things up is when you get all those people together and you get them talking together, then they find these spaces that didn't exist before, and they find ways to get into that space. And that, that's ultimately what you have to do. The problem is in a space that doesn't belong to anybody right now. Well, again, it's exciting what these two coalitions are doing. Yeah, it's really awesome. Well, we just keep banging away at it. Well, thank you very much. We will be there. Thank you, everybody. So will I hear from somebody? Yeah, we'll be back. Good. Yeah, we can do it over the phone or we can like back to show slides. Okay, great. It's amazing. I have a caught up. I have a caught up. Yeah.